Hi everybody from Rome, this is John. Excited to check in from Rome, from Italy, um, and to give you an update on uh, how things are here. It's not really an update. As some of you may know, I've been keeping a diary, uh, which I've been putting up on Facebook. And this is the diary that I put up for um, Saturday last, which was actually my second last diary because today uh, the partial reopening, the partial return to some kind of normality began in Italy. But I thought I'd read this one because it has lots of joys in it. Italian Diary, 2nd of May, 2020. Could you make a hole in another pint? Could a swim, duck? says I. What we are all missing at this time is not so much the extraordinary, those necessary occasional escapes from the rhythms, habits and challenges of our daily lives, but the ordinary and the everyday that we were so used to complaining about, what Seamus Heaney calls the unregarded data of the usual life, in a reference to Patrick Havner's poetry. A. Houseman is one of many poets who described the weariness we often feel with routine in his poem, Yonder See the Morning. Yonder see the morning blink, the sun is up and up must I, to wash and dress and eat and drink, and look at things and talk and think and work, and God knows why. Oh, often I have washed and dressed, and what's to show for all my pain? And I abed and rest, ten thousand times I've done my best and all's to do again. One of the ordinary things that is now out of reach here in Italy is the trip to the barber or the hairdresser, and this is a challenge for many people. Call me old-fashioned, but I disapprove of small children with long hair, and favour a well-kempt head, even during lockdown. So yesterday I decided it was time to take action and give Enrico, who's eight, a necessary haircut. Alice, his mother, somewhat reluctantly agreed, and Enrico, having no choice in the matter, and not quite knowing whether to laugh or cry, went along with it. To be fair to me, I do have some hair cutting history. Back in 1984, during my brief foray into the Jesuit novitiate, where uh, all hair cutting was in house, I immediately volunteered and learned my trade on the six sitting victims who had nowhere to hide. I was not much of a believer in the scissors, but preferred the electric clipper or trimmer. You set the length you want and off you go, cutting all before you. On one occasion, having completed a successful and rather neat haircut, the suddenly emboldened client asked if I might also trim his beard, a beard that, like all beards, had been grown and nurtured with great care and attention over many months. That, as Brendan Behan wrote, was where Ockram was lost. As I soon find out, it takes but the, sli the slightest slip of the hand to put a gaping hole in a beard. And was close to tears as I tried to repair the damage by evening things up. He was left with little more than stubble. Ten years later, I lost my own hair. It all happened rather quickly, but I do remember being out for dinner with my dad in Dublin. My father had had a stroke many years earlier, and this had removed whatever inhibitions he had ever had, not many, even though, or perhaps because, ordinary speech was such a huge effort for him after that. He had the words, but couldn't get them out although sometimes he did. As I lowered my head to begin to eat my soup, I heard from across the table loudly, Jesus, you're losing your effing hair. It sounded like an accusation. It was. Everyone in the restaurant heard it with me, and I wanted the ground to swallow me up. It's not exactly my fault, I said a little lamely, before admitting that I was getting thin on top. But by then he had already started chuckling along with several of the other customers. Shortly afterwards, I took the plunge and, brought, and bought the trimmer and became a full-time skinner. I never looked back, and when my sons, Liam and Owen, were small, I was their barber. They got the zero haircut in summer and as close as during the rest of the year. To call it a sensible haircut would be an understatement. It also saved a fortune. Enrico had the good sense to insist that he did not want to be left bald at eight. So I managed to achieve what might be called a tidy haircut. All was going well until his mother suggested it could be a little shorter. Maybe I could do a kind of gentle fade along the back and sides, something approaching the Ronaldo look. Needless to say, between Enrico twitching and my being less than convinced by this attempt to fade and shade, 
the slight shortening at the back became quite radical. This morning Enrico, who, like the rest of us, luckily cannot see the back of his own head, is exhibiting the perfect bowl haircut. Even if the bowl is slightly chipped here and there, it will grow back. Another of the ordinary things that we are all missing are the bars, coffee shops, ice cream parlours, pubs, restaurants, which are all stable parts of our social diet wherever we are. We are wondering when and how and if they will reopen. With social distancing and a third of the usual clientele, what is a pizza or a pint likely to cost? Policies during the dark years of World War I, when all normality was suspended, is the book that more than any other proclaims the importance of the quotidian and celebrates the extraordinary, in flawed, ordinary lives. While well, appear, well aware of the dangers of drink, George captured quotidian pub life in Dublin like no other, except perhaps Flan O'Brien. How many pub habitués or even occasional drinkers would not now concur with this affirmation? Ah, ow, oh, don't be talking. I was blue mouldy for the want of that pint. And the pint downed concludes, Declare to God I could hear it hit the pit of me stomach with a click. Joyce, as we all know, had a brilliant capacity to describe pub life, ordinary pub life, and pub characters like Bob Doran, who appeared in his story The Boarding House, where he is harried into marriage to Polly Mooney by her mother, who, as we read, dealt with moral problems as a cleaver deals with meat. Doran soon finds himself trapped in an unhappy marriage and appears unhappily snoring in the corner of Barney Kiernan's pub many years later in Ulysses. Little Alf Bergen popped in round the door and hid behind Barney's snug, squeezed up with the laughing. Who was sitting up there in the corner that I hadn't seen, snoring, blind drunk to the world, only Bob, Doran? The men later discuss the recently defunct Paddy Dignam, whose funeral took place earlier in the day. But Alf Bergen is convinced he has just seen him on the street. How's Willie Murray these times, Alf? No, says Alf. I saw him just now in Capel Street with uh, Paddy Dignam. Only I was running after that. You what? Says Joe, throwing down the letters. With who? With Dignam, says Alf. Is it Paddy? Says Joe. Yes, says Alf. Why? Don't you know he's dead? Says Joe. Paddy Dignam. Dead? says Alf. Aye, says Joe. Sure I'm after seeing him not five minutes ago, says Alf, as plain as a pike staff. Who's dead? says Bob Dorn. You saw his ghost then, says Joe, God between us and harm. What? says Alf. Good Christ, only five, what? And Willie Murray with him, the two of them down there near whatchamacallums. What? Dignam. Dead. What about Dignam? says Bob Morin. Who's talking about? Dead, says Alf. He's no more dead than you are. Maybe so, says Joe. They took the liberty of burying him this morning, anyhow. Paddy, says Alf. Aye, says Joe. He paid the debt of nature. God be merciful to him. Good Christ, says Alf. Be gob, he was what you might call flabbergasted. Bob Doran doesn't take this news very well. Who said Christ is good? I beg your parsnip, says Alf. Is that a good Christ, says Bob Doran, to take away poor little Willie Dignam? Ah well, says Alf, trying to pass it off. He's over all his troubles. But Bob Doran shouts out of him, He's a bloody ruffian, I say, to take away poor little Willie Dignam. Terry came down and tipped him the wink to keep quiet, that they didn't want that kind of talk in their respectable licensed premises. And Bob Doran starts doing the weeps about Paddy Dignam true as you're there. The finest man, he says, snivelling. The finest, purest character. Joyce celebrated everyday life and death in all its aspects with grace and with great humour but also with cutting realism. 
The Cyclops episode owes much to his father and his friends and to the Dublin that he left behind. There isn't a trace of sentimentality. Joyce achieved perspective from afar from what he calls in Finnegan's Wake the safe side of distance. Today most of us are living at a distance from our usual lives. There's not a thing wrong then with allowing ourselves at a time like this to wallow a little more in our now suspended habitual in celebrating the routine ordinariness of our usual lives and with wanting a little of them back. At the same time as we live through these difficult and challenging days and weeks there is equally no harm in realising how lucky we have been in our now frozen normality an everyday normality that we will nonetheless have to somewhat reinvent as we emerge from this crisis in the months and years ahead. This enforced distance can help us gain the necessary perspective to understand what is vital and what is not, what we took for ordinary, but will really, which will really have to be extraordinary from now on. And so that's my, the end of my diary for Saturday last, and um, at this point I'll sign off and express the hope that I will see many of you in Trieste uh, in summer of 2021. Thank you.